All right. So uh, to begin, I'm going to go through a little bit of terminology that um, I would have hoped I would have gotten to in lecture, um, but I didn't. So we'll do it now. Uh, I'm not. We'll, we're going to revisit this stuff later in lecture, uh, but for now, I'm just going to give you a few of the pointers. So uh, first, some just terminology, origin and insertion, for, for those of you who don't know, uh, every muscle has a fixed point of a, two fixed points of attachment, one being the origin, the other being the insertion. The origin is, um, I shouldn't say fixed point, one is fixed, one is moving. So the fixed point of attachment is what we call the origin, and the moving point of attachment is the insertion. Um, Almost all, it's difficult to think of one that's not, but om, but there are a few. Almost all muscles are going to originate somewhere on the skeleton. It's going to start, uh, it's going to have its fixed attachment on some bone somewhere. All right. The insertion doesn't have to be. The insertion, there are muscles, for example, the muscles that you smile. That is attached to the connective tissue around your mouth. The insertion is not actually on a bone. But all origins are attached to a bone. Um, and all of the muscles that we're going to consider today have uh, both the origin and the insertion on a bone. Uh, origin is also usually proximal to the insertion. That means the origin is closer to your midline, closer to the core. So when we're talking about appendicular skeleton, uh, the origin is further up your arm, the insertion. Um, so here are a couple examples. I was able to find a nice high-res picture of the origin and insertion of the bicep brachii. Uh, so the, the origin is uh, there on uh, the coracoid process and part of the glenoid cavity uh, of the scapula. And the insertion is on the radial tuberosity of the radius. So when you flex your arm, that radial tuberosity, the radius, that insertion is what's actually moving, and the origin is not. The muscle contracts and moves our arm. And origin and insertion. We're not, uh, I couldn't find a better picture of the origin and insertion of the rectus femoris, uh, but I was in a hurry. So here's a picture of it, anyways. This is the uh, right leg, and um, you can see that the origin is. Uh, on the on the ischial spine of the of the pelvis, and the insertion is actually on the patellar tendon. The uh, rectus femoris is an interesting uh, muscle because it crosses two joints. It crosses both the hip and the knee joint. It's the patella, that sesamoid bone in the patellar tendon, that helps transduce that uh, power of the rectus femoris across uh, two joints. So, all right. Origin and insertion. Next is uh, important terminology of agonist and antagonist. Uh, yeah, so an, an agonist is the prime mover, in, like when you're considering some sort of motion. For example, the flexion of the forearm. Right? Flexion of the forearm, the agonist is the bicep brachialis or the uh, bicep brachii or the brachialis. An antagonist is a motion that opposes, it's a muscle that opposes that motion. So when considering flexion of the forearm, the antagonistic muscle is the tricep uh, brachii. So it's going to oppose the movement of a particular agonist, right? And those can switch, it's, those, those are relative terms, right? Uh, if I was thinking about extension of the forearm, the agonist would be the tricep, and the antagonist would be the bicep just when you're considering a particular kind of motion, uh, the agonist is what uh, elicits that motion, and the antagonist is the what elicits the opposite or undoes that motion. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. That 
was it changing? Yeah, so <clears throat> Annie, we're going to, or I'm sorry, Amy, uh, I chose her for that day because she minutely dissects those poses. And we're going to do a bunch of those poses today. And I, I want you to think about what she was talking about. So in those poses, certain muscles are going to be, and if you, you didn't give me particularly specific. Certain muscles are going to be engaged and others will be released. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to talk for a moment about some of the, the neurology, the, the motor neurons that is underlying that, just so you can get a sense of what uh, what's actually happening. And it'll, I'll help unpack some of what she was talking about in a qualitative sense. Today we're going to try to quantify all right, so yeah, just be patient. We'll, we'll get right there. Uh, the last concept is a synergist. A synergist is just a smaller muscle that's going to help stabilize a joint or add uh, a little bit to the prime mover, the agonist. So synergists are synergistically working with an agonistic muscle. All right, <clears throat> so uh, these agonists and antagonists, they work in uh, opposite pairs. When one contracts, the other stretches. So when I contract my bicep brachii, the tricep is getting stretched. And likewise, when I contract the tricep, that bicep is, is getting lengthened. All right? It's getting lengthened. Um, so, for example, that's the kind of relationship that you would see between flexors and extensors or abductors and adductors. All right? When you flex a particular uh, abductor, you're going to stretch the adductor corresponding or agonistic adductors. So here are just a few uh, pairs of agonist antagonist muscles that are in the body, real common ones. So we said bicep tricep, uh, deltoids and latissimus dorsi is a pair, uh, pec major in the chest and the trapezius and rhomboids in the back, those are, uh, those are an antagonistic pair. Uh, the rectus abdominis, that that flexes the trunk, and the erector spinae, which extends the trunk. Uh, iliopsoas, uh, which is going to flex the hip, and the gluteus maximus, which is going to extend the hip. Um, however, today we are going to focus on on these pair. And in fact, this was my uh, this was my initial when I the slide yeah, This was my initial. Uh, aspiration, but I've actually eliminated them. So the middle on the hip adductor, gluteus medius, knock that one. Eh. Putting electrodes on everybody's cheeks seems like a little bit uh, far to figure out for the day. So we're going <laughs> to keep it, keep it a little bit mellower. Yeah, and just do uh, quadriceps uh, and the hamstrings. So the quadriceps, in particular the rectus femoris and the bicep uh, for Morris in the back, and then the gastrocnemius, which is your calf muscle, and the anterior tibial or tibialis anterior, which is the muscle that runs down parallel to your. So those are are the two two pairs. We're going to be observing four muscles today. Um, so next, I want to talk a little bit about the wiring a little bit about the wiring, and I'm going to talk about them in, in terms of reflex arcs, in terms of a reflex arc, but we are not necessarily, we will be using reflex arcs in some of the poses, uh, they'll, they'll be engaged, but um, not necessarily in the same way, but this wiring will help me talk about uh, the, these talking about reflex arcs will help me talk about the wiring that uh, is coming from top down. So in general, a reflex arc is a neural pathway that happens exclusively in the peripheral nervous system. So there's the central nervous system, which is the brain and spinal cord, and then there are all the nerves that extend out. A reflex arc is, in general, uh, is a somatic central something that just exists in the brain. It, it passes through the central nervous system here in the spinal cord, which is the cross section. And we're going to get collaterals that send 
branches up to the brain. So for example, in this, uh, in somebody puts their hand on a tap, and as soon as you put your hand on a tap or on a hot stove or something, ow, you like, you, you lift it up. Your body's immediate reaction is to lift it up. And that's because you get this pain receptor comes out of the hand and signals on this what's called interneuron sends a signal up to the brain and says, look at you're stepping into the brain. <laughs> and uh, it's also going to send a branch here. So one of these is going to go up and synapse in the brain, but the other is going to synapse on a motor neuron, on a, on a neuron that is going to drive a muscle. Right? So this pain will synapse on a muscle fiber in the uh, muscle that will help you pull your hand away. That very, very basic. That's a, that's a reflex arc. So let's let's get a little bit further. Let's get a little further into this. We have uh, these things called muscle spindles. A muscle spindle apparatus is a uh, it's a, it's a sensory neuron that has been adapted, a special adaptation of a sens sensory neuron that gets embedded in the connective tissue around a muscle. Remember, we haven't talked about muscle and microanatomy in great detail yet. We, we'll get there. But for, for now, there are these specialized things, that uh, these muscle spindles, that if they stretch, that's how you trigger them. So this is what's going to give us the MSR, the muscle stretch reflex. All right. So you trigger it, uh, you trigger one of these muscle spindles, and it sends a signal out uh, through the nervous system. So here's an example. We, uh, you guys have probably all had this happen to you. you. Go to the doctor, they bang your head, and stretches the patellar tendon. There is one of these muscle spindles in. That uh, in that connective tissue that gets triggered and it comes up to the spinal cord and it it activates an effector and that muscle will fire. Okay, so muscle stretch uh, reflex. No, they're all there's tons of them. Yeah, there's tons of them. Uh, okay, so. This, I'm, I'm heading this way. This is where I want to be. So uh, this is going to be a flexor reflex, um, and but I'm, I'm showing antagonistic inhibition. And this is where where Annie or Amy was yesterday or on Tuesday, and where we want to go to. So uh, what happens here is, in terms of the reflex, you touch something hot, touch something hot, sends this signal up to the central nervous system. And we have a branch that goes up, tells the brain, "Wop, well, you, you hit something hot, you're in trouble, you can yourself. But it also is going to synapse on these, synapse on these two uh, neurons. One of them is going to go to the flexor. That's going to cause the hand to let go. And the other pathway comes through uh, a neuron that goes to an extensor on the backside, the, the trapezius, or the, I'm sorry, the, tri the tricep. You're going to make, uh, make it so that this flexor doesn't have to fight against its antagonist. Right? This nerve, its job is to turn this muscle off. It's an inhibitory nerve. Not all neurons turn muscles on. Some of them turn them off. Yeah, okay? So, you know, what's different here, you notice that these two neurons, this excitatory neuron and this inhibitory neuron, they're getting, they're having synapses from some neurons that live in the central nervous system, right? There's this white one, and then there's this, like, dot, dotted black line. Now, these are two neurons that live in the central nervous system. These neurons don't have to be stimulated by this sensory neuron. It can come from can come from top down, which is what we're going to actually be doing. We're not going to be trying to do yoga while singeing our hands on the stove. 
we're going to, we're going to be just doing yoga, right? So those those central signals from the central nervous system from our brain, they can come down, and when it tells us to engage the flexor, the extensor can get inhibited. We're going to try, we're going to try to engage this kind of a pathway, right? So there's this is called collateral collateral inhibition or antagonistic inhibition. Sometimes we have to fight against that, right? We're, we're fighting against that because maybe our hamstrings, for example, are tight. Maybe they're really tight. And if we're going forward, ow, it hurts. Maybe it hurts to do a forward bend. And that muscle is going to react, that pain is going to react and cause that muscle to clench up, right? But we can use our brains turn on the other muscle, the antagonistic muscle, on the other side, interrupt that signal, and help us release the hand so we can get deeper into the hand. It's real easy to do a forward bend and forget about your quadriceps, because you don't actually need your quadriceps to come forward. Right? It's, it's hip flexors. Quads help with that, but it's they're, they're only a little, little bit of that joint. They're, they're mostly doing the knee joint. They do the hip joint. So when we're bending forward, we can do it. We can use gravity. We don't need to use those, those quads. But if we engage the quads, it helps us get past uh, engagement in the hamstring and uh, start this antagonistic inhibition, which is what we actually want. So we can override uh, the whatever pain reflex we may be feeling. Okay, uh, so here's an example, uh, different, a little bit lower res diagram in the actual muscles that we're going to be looking at. So here is the bicep femoris, and here is, oh, I'm sorry, here's the rectus femoris and the bicep femoris. Uh, we get a signal, a stretch signal coming in uh, from up here. It causes this to engage and this one uh, to relieve. We'll actually be doing the opposite. When we stretch that muscle back here in the hamstring, that's getting stretched, and that's going to send a signal up that is going to cause this to engage and this to release, but we want to flip. So they're, they're actually quite different. Um, when you are, that's it's a, it's a little bit of a, a tangent here, but uh, when you're rolling, you are compressing the tissue, uh, you're excluding blood from the tissue, and then allowing new blood to come in. You may be breaking up adhesions that you have in the tissue. Uh, you're realigning the, the collagen fiber and the areolar. And maybe like helping to release muscle tonus, that like baseline muscle tonus, like an overcontracted muscle tonus. Whereas when you're stretching, you are actually pulling the sarcomeres apart. So we'll we'll go through exactly this when I get to the next slide. So we're we're heading into excitatory tissue next, which would be muscle and nerves after I'm done with the stretching stuff. And we'll get there. I just no, no, it's cool. It's a, it's a great question. Excellent question. Thank you for it. Uh, but we'll, I'll, I'll answer that in more detail in lecture, I promise. So uh, what else? These, these pathways can get quite sophisticated. They can get quite sophisticated. Um, and they can be uh, have, have ipsilateral or contralateral uh, ramifications. Ipsilateral means all on the same side of your body. Contralateral is crossing. So here's an example of <clears throat> contralateral uh, reflex passage. Huh? <laughs> oh, well, Lego and stuff attack. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. I should have time for that. Uh, 
you can see here that this guy steps on a Lego and his, uh, yeah, and the extensor is inhibited, the flexor gets engaged, but the opposite pattern happens on this side, all right? Because if you're jumping up with this foot, you need to be pushing down with this foot so you don't fall, right? You can have quite complicated patterns of inhibition and engagement. And so the, the point is, often when you are in some kind of a pose, and it, it's, you're focusing on one leg, it's good to, to not forget the other, because often what's happening in the other leg can help you uh, with the leg you're primarily pay attention to. Bottom line is there are, there are very complicated wiring patterns uh, that we're going to try to explore, not in great detail, but we're going to so there is a paper that um, will will be on the uh, Moodle assignment portal that all this is going to get put up on. But uh, I was able to find uh, a paper in the primary literature where they looked at it was like the the only. Uh, systematic EMG that I could find a study of uh, muscle engagement in various asana in yoga. But I got one, uh, and we'll be able to use some of this. And so here's some data uh, from that paper. Um, and the way this works is here are the muscles that they're looking at, uh, anterior tibialis and gastrocnemius, and femoris and bicep. So these are the two pairs of muscles that we're going to uh, check out today. And here are some of the poses. Chair, downward dog, half moon. I do not, we're not going to do half moon today. I'm striking that. I thought we might. Uh, and then tree, and then uh, warrior three. So we're, I'm, I'm cutting half moon and warrior three out. I know we practice those with Amy, but uh, let's just keep it, let's keep it straightforward. So chair, downward dog, and tree the ones that are in this paper, I, I would like to add maybe forward bend uh, to that and maybe warrior one if we have time. I don't know. But uh, this paper didn't cover them. So certainly we'll do chair, downward dog, and tree. What's the which? Oh, uh, this muscle is glute medius. The, la the light blue column is, is glute medius. Uh, that They also looked at engagement, um, and it should have hip adductor, like the gracilis and adductor longus, if they were going to really have it in antagonistic pairs, uh, but I, they didn't have any anti antagonist data for that, and I didn't really want to deal with, like, wrapping electrodes and glute and adductor. Keep it, keep it easy. So we'll just do these. Um, and also, let's look at this. Uh, let's look at this in more detail here. So here's this, uh, some more things from this paper. We've got, uh, here's the anatomy again. So here's a lateral view of your right foot. We'll be doing all of this on the dominant side. Um, maybe we can do both. I, I wanted to do both. Uh, Minimally, I want to do the dominant side. So we'll, everybody will strap up their right leg or left leg. Um, and here's the anatomy. So we have the gastrocnemius, right? That's, the, that's your calf muscle on the surface of your calf. And then the tibialis. So let's see what happens. Here's this woman. Uh, she's in chair pose. You're familiar with that. We've done that a number of times this semester. and uh, the gastrocnemius in chair pose has less than 10%, like 5% uh, EMG engagement, basically no signal. On that, on that trace that you would see on the open uh, BCI ganglion, whatever, uh, it would be basically a straight line. And this, this study was conducted on something like 30 individuals. Uh, 
or maybe even more, I forget. Uh, a large number of people, they measured this, and a very small error bar here, right? So it's fairly uniform amongst these uh, yogis, and, and they only picked people who were practicing at a high level. So these were actual um, yogis who had uh, some skill. Anyways, the, the gastrocnemius was not engaged, whereas when you look at the anterior tibial, it is engaged, all right? Up, upwards of 60% of max uh, intensity for the EMG. That's pretty high. Now let's think about that. So we're here uh, in chair pose. The gastrocnemius is something that flexes the foot. It makes you stand on your toes. It helps you push you forward when you're running, okay? And the anterior tibial flexes your foot, brings the foot upward, the top of the foot upward. So if that makes sense that we're seeing that pattern, all right? It makes sense that we're seeing that. Um, and that one's pretty straightforward. Downward dog. Downward dog. Let's move on to that one. So downward dog, uh, we see uh, these people who have a fairly advanced practice, they are releasing their gastrocnemius so that heel can come down towards the mat. And uh, <clears throat> the anterior tibial in these people is not engaged as much. It's not engaged as much. What would be interesting for me is to see how much the people that had a lot of engagement in anterior tibial if there was collateral inhibition and they were able to get a greater release of the gastrocnemius. That's what the wiring in their, in their bodies would suggest. Um, so anyways, that's what we're trying to go for. When you're in downward dog, thinking about the anterior tibial and engaging that muscle on the front side, like bringing that foot upwards, engagement through there, is going to help you release the gastrocnemius and send those heels down to the mat. Remember, Amy was talking about that line at the back of the at the back of the knee there, uh, and like her taking the back of your thigh up against the wall, right? But uh, from the knee down, just letting it sink down into the mat. This is what she's talking about. Okay, so we're going to try to we're going to try to explore that uh, here. Then tree pose. Um, so in tree pose, we have pretty high levels of engagement for both muscles, actually, don't we? Why is that? What do you think? What's going on here? Let's look at the pose. Dissect that for me. Is, is she flexing or not flexing that ankle joint? She's engaging it, but she's not actually flexing or extending it that much, is she? She's not bending forward into it like she would be in chair or downward dog. She's balancing on it, isn't she? She's balancing on it. So she needs strong muscular engagement all around uh, that ankle to stabilize it. She's trying to stabilize the joint so there's muscle engagement on the front and back. She's using a distinctly different neural pathway to engage the same muscle. Yep, yep, standing leg, yeah, this, that. So we're doing this because, we're doing this because it is a standing leg that's really accentuating the muscles around that joint to stabilize that joint, because you don't have both feet on the ground. Both feet on the ground, knees locked, you, it doesn't take a lot of muscle to stand. One leg up, knee not locked, it takes muscles all the way around, the, all the muscles around that, uh, that control that ankle joint to stabilize that person, to balance that person. And you can see that here in the difference uh, between uh, that EMG and the ones for these others. Okay? So we're going to explore that. The second muscle group that we're going to look at is uh, the... <clears throat> Bicep femoris, rectus femoris pair. All right, so here's the anatomy. Uh, 
I did. I had to do a lateral shot, so it's the only way I you can see them both in, in the picture. It's not really the best for both of either of them. But um, rectus femoris is the is the muscle that goes down the front of the quadriceps, and the bicep femoris is uh, on the lateral side. Uh, it's the hamstrings on the lateral side of uh, your. So let's look at this. Um, again, this woman's in tree pose. In tree pose, her uh, bicep femoris is hardly engaged at all. And we have a moderate engagement here on the rectus femoris, 30%. Certainly enough to keep you in chair pose. Now, rectus femoris, keeping in mind, that's a strong muscle, right? That's like boom, kicking a ball or something like that, right? When you're up here at like 30, 50, 60, 90% of capacity in that muscle, you're doing more than just standing, right? That muscle has a lot of power in it uh, for extending your knee. And we're, you don't use all of that power in, in this pose, but you're using some of it for sure. And again, it's this collateral inhibition that we're seeing. So sitting here, uh, in, in chair pose, we are releasing bicep femoris, releasing bicep femoris, and engaging rectus femoris. Let's look at this pair with downward dog. All right. <clears throat> downward dog has us, again, releasing bicep femoris. This makes sense because we're in downward dog. We're trying to stretch our hamstring. Posterior compartment. Um, rectus femoris in most of these people was actually still not especially engaged. They had, this number was kind of low. This number was kind of low. Um, I believe that you that number could be higher. That number could be higher. This is like an equivocal number to me. It's equivocal to me. Um, it, it, you don't need that quad to flex uh, the hips and a lot of times people aren't thinking about it when they're in downward dog that those kneecaps are not being raised are not being pulled up but if you do do that it will help release the hamstring all right um okay and then here in tree pose so uh again this is the engagement of uh, the bicep femoris and moderate to nil engagement of the rectus femoris. Not a big, a big story here. Neither of them were especially turned on, uh, probably because a lot of these people who were locking their knee and not unlocking the knee and actually engaging. So above the knee in this pose, these muscles, uh, if the knee is locked, you're not really using them a whole lot. And so the idea is to actually get out of that and see uh, if, if you can use those muscles. But they should work together. They are at about the same level here. That's really the point of this data. They're at about the same level. Yes, ma'am. Locking your knees is not Yeah, what happens with the knee when, uh, when you lock your knee, there is a slight rotation. There's a slight rotation of one bone on the other. In that knee. And so it really like sucks it right in there and locks it. When you bend your knee, it like it there's like a very slight rotation and that and the joint's not stable at that point. The knee gets locked. It's like when you're putting this knuckles in your hand. Uh interdigital. It's between the, the tibia and, and the femur there. There's like a it just sort of the, the surface, the articular surfaces, uh, when, when it gets locked, they, they just um, grooves that fit into one another so that it doesn't require a whole lot of muscle to stabilize that joint. That joint becomes effectively a single, a single bone. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's all the slides I was able to cobble together there. But, um, all right. So. Why don't we, the first thing is I'm going to upload the actual text for the, uh, 
I, ha I have the text more or less written out. Uh, I'll upload that to the uh, Moodle, and uh, and I'll upload the the paper that I want you to go through. So at the beginning of it is uh, there are going to be some reading. So in Simon Borg, uh, Olivier, and, and Mal Matchless, uh, that text, The Anatomy and Physiology of Yoga, there's a couple brief readings that I would like you to just scan over. These are like, you know, safety things, how to do these poses properly. Uh, it'll take you just a minute to look over that. And then uh, I'll put the PDF uh, that I just showed you up there so you can have that as your reference as well. Then we'll move in uh, to the actual uh, the actual thing. Here are the muscle groups that we're going to be exploring. And here are the poses uh, that will be chair, downward uh, dog, and tree. And then I also like to add, the paper doesn't cover them, but I'd like to add standing forward bend. If we have time, warrior one, it seems like it might be a good idea. Um, and what you're going to do is you're going to put uh, get the go to that same Open BCI link that you had, uh, the Open BCI software, and, and open up the same tutorial link that you had last time, and hook up the electrodes this time on the muscles that you want to trace. So a pair of electrodes will go on uh, gastrocnemius, a pair will go on uh, anterior tibial. Uh, a pair will go on rectus femoris, and a pair will go on bicep femoris. And you'll have all four of those channels going. Instead of just one trace, like last time, you'll have all four of those channels are running to be able to monitor. One, you'll work with your same partner, um, and uh, what I have here is uh, anticipated responses. Uh, so again, I, I haven't had fully type all this out, I was just trying to conceive of this, but uh, so for ga gastrocnemius in chair, we're trying to turn off the gastrocnemius, <coughs> trying to turn on the anterior tibia, turn, trying to turn on rectus femoris, and turn off bicep femoris, okay? And so what you'll do for each of those muscles, uh, for each of those asana, in those four muscles, you're going to, uh, you're going to have one reading where uh, you're doing the pose and your partner is uh, is looking at the computer and is quantifying uh, your engagement or not or lack of engagement. Then you'll get a chance to look the second thing you'll get a chance to look at the computer and see whether those muscles try to use your observation of so that you'll Whenever, if you're in chair pose, you'll be able to look at the monitor and try to use your ability to see those traces to see if you can get um, the muscles to match the, the pattern a little bit better. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, there'll be there'll be the, the baseline, which is what your partner is gonna is gonna uh, measure on the trace, and then you'll look at it and see if you can change. That's what I'm hoping for. And Again, remember, this lab is, we're in the development stage here, so we're going to see if this makes sense. I don't know. But I've never done this. Try it out. I guess I'm just asking for data. Yeah. So I'll, I'm going to, as you all are getting uh, hacked together a little data spreadsheet, what I'll probably do is just put this in a tab and just show you what I have. Make sense? Okay. Um, yeah, materials are in here. And then 